Hello, everyone. It's Sinead Willihan back with you and the lovely Barbara Lamb, my friend who I'm interviewing for a series on her channel. I'm also going to be putting these videos on my channel. But the main purpose is for this wonderful knowledge and experience that Barbara has accumulated after so many years of being an expert in this field. Um, she feels like she has more that she wants to share. And so we wanted to do this series as a way of keeping people up to date with what Barbara is thinking and what she is ruminating about, what she's um, experiencing in her work and any new insights plus what she already knows. We want to be able to share these things with you. So Barbara, hi, we're back for episode hi. two of Barbara School. How are you doing? Absolutely. What fun this is. That is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is. Good. Today's going to be interesting, I hope, for people uh, talking about past life recalls. Yes. And by that, I mean that I have been in certain places, certain times, certain situations, where suddenly, out of the blue, I would have a very profound sense of remembering that I had been there in that place sometime long ago. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just like a thought or an imagination. It was like, oh my God, I remember this. Oh yeah, that's where I used to sit. Or that's where the person I loved was over there. Or, you know, oh yeah, I remember doing this process here as a different person. Sometimes in those spontaneous past life recalls, I was a female. Mm -hmm. which of course I am now. Um, and sometimes in those recalls, I was a male. And sometimes I was white. One time I was Chinese. One time I was a very dark black African man. Uh, another time I was a spontaneous um, fur trapper up in the North Woods somewhere, Northern Canada, probably. Wow. So uh, it's been a very interesting a series of events that have happened always spontaneously when I'm not thinking about anything like that. It's just that in certain places that has triggered a memory. And I finally put the phrase on it, past life, spontaneous past life recalls. And I think that it's nice to share it because there are other people I meet who sometimes have had something like this happen and they're just totally mystified about it. They they just don't know what to make of it, what to think of it. And they sometimes they even doubt themselves like, well, what's the matter with me? Why did I think I had been there in that place before? And yet I was somehow different. And so it can be reaffirming and sort of reassuring to people uh, who hear these things from me. So that's really why I like to share it. And also it sort of enlarges our whole context of reality. Really that is. is that we are ongoing continuing souls primarily. That's what we are through, through it all. And then we do choose to come into different incarnations, different lifetimes here and there uh, to experience many, many things. And over a long period of time and many lifetimes, we experience a really wide range of ways of living and uh, ways of being different genders and in different cultures and different dynamics going on. So it really helps to enlarge that larger picture, I think. Mm -hmm. And this lifetime that each of us are living right now, uh, this counts, counts very much. And it's not our only one. We have many, many, many lifetimes. And we will probably have many more. Yes. Although I occasionally meet somebody who said, I think this is my last lifetime, but I don't feel that personally. I feel, oh, yeah, there's plenty more that I need to come here to do, mm -hmm. uh, not only to experience, but hopefully to contribute to the good on Earth. 
And so Dave, anyway, what, other, what other point is there, right? What other point is there other than to do that? And I just, I just want to ask you really quickly as well, um, because you're mentioning the past lives that you've had in terms of being on earth, but there also, it's possible for people to have had past lives that are off earth also. And you've experienced that um, through your clients, I believe. I'm not sure if you've experienced it personally. Right. Good for you. I'm so glad that you're mentioning that. Um, I have not experienced that directly in terms of being regressed to a life as an extraterrestrial, but I have regressed plenty of other people and in their past lives or one of them or a few of them, uh, they have found that they were extraterrestrial beings. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, uh, they were extraterrestrial beings who came here to Earth and either crashed here or landed and either were able to fly away again or weren't, oh, wow. uh, depending on the person, or I should say the extraterrestrial. Oh, interesting. Um, and I have regressed people uh, directly into uh, past lives that they have had as extraterrestrial beings. And with one woman... Years ago, uh, we went to a lifetime when she was an extraterrestrial being, and she was becoming dissatisfied with the kind of consciousness that she and her fellow beings had on whatever that planet was. So she died from that incarnation and then decided to go into another lifetime as a different species of extraterrestrials on a different planet. And those beings um, were more advanced in consciousness. So she had two or three lifetimes with that group wow. and died after each one. And then she went into um, an incarnation where she was with beings who were very much experiencing group mind. In other words, they were all so completely telepathic that they not only knew what each other were thinking, uh, but that they would all get trained eventually in that particular species to have that hive mind, group mind. In other words, that they would all as a group be thinking the same thing at the same time. Well, when she was on that planet as one of them, uh, she developed very much into that group mind, but she still wasn't really ready to give up her own individual thoughts too. Mm -hmm. So after the, that last of that little series of incarnations, she incarnated as still a different species of extraterrestrials, and that species had her be very involved with physical healing. And they even did physical healing of abducted human beings. Wow. So in one of those regressions that we did, uh, she found herself as one of those beings, a whole different body type, wow. uh, different size, uh, different clothing, you know, like a very uh, well-fitting bodysuit and definitely looking and being extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. And she found that she was standing with other beings like her and they were standing around a massage type table, medical type table, and they were working on the physical healing of an abducted human man. And so she was learning. We got into some of the details of how she and they were doing the healing. And she said they were working with the energy code point of healing that particular individual. Wow. Now, that regression in particular helped her to suddenly understand why she had lost her corporate job with a major phone company and was rising up the executive ladder. She was probably eventually going to be a vice president. And um, so a good career mm -hmm. and very well paid. But she had 
before that last regression, she had quit her job and opened up a little studio for doing healing, physical healing here on earth as a human. That is uh, a change. Other human beings. And then when we did this regression to how she had been long ago as an extraterrestrial being a healer extraterrestrial oh it suddenly all made sense that that desire to continue to heal humans uh, came right through into this lifetime and finally came through you know it impressed her so much that she really dedicated her life to doing that and she still is doing that to this day and and doing it very well so that's that's some information about some of the regressions that I've done. I've done so many, uh, probably, oh, uh, by now it's probably 6,000 oh regressions. Some of them to, many of them to people's past lives, which are mostly past lives on earth that they've gone to. But there are quite a number, as I was saying, that have regressed to experiences that they've had as extraterrestrials living on other planets. Uh, and now I'm going to move that topic to the side a bit and now talk about the phenomenon of having spontaneous past life recalls. Yes, I would love to hear so about this. It all, now, I had never heard of such a thing. And I grew up and went all the way through college and marriage and having a couple of children, three children, and um, without ever particularly thinking about reincarnation or past lives, um, I had heard that people in India uh, believed in reincarnation and perhaps some of the other countries in that part of the world too. So I respected that, but I didn't really believe in it. Uh, there was nothing teaching me in this life here in the Western part of the world that emphasized anything about reincarnation. So it was a great surprise to me when my first experience happened. That experience happened in 1968. I was a young woman and I was having a massage uh, by a wonderful a woman who was a good massage therapist. And I got into a very deeply relaxed state lying there on her massage table. And toward the end of that massage experience, I suddenly was aware that I wasn't there on that massage table anymore, that I was in the Middle Eastern part of the world and it looked like I was flying over the Suez Canal. Oh my gosh. So that was a surprise. I looked down, I could see the water, I could see the desert on both sides. And, and the feeling of just sort of gently just drifting, flying through the air. Very, very pleasant daytime sunshine. And I looked at myself and there I was looking like, a harem woman. In other words, the uh, Middle Eastern kind of clothes that sometimes the belly dancers wear. Uh -huh. And that I was a I was aware that I was a harem wife. Oh my God. And I must have died. And here I was flying along, just noticing the earth, enjoying the looking down on the earth before going on the, into higher planes. So that was very interesting. And then when that massage ended and I sat up, I said to the therapist, wow, I don't understand this, but I just wasn't here for a while. And she said, I know, I could tell. And I told her what I had been experiencing. And she said, oh, well, probably two things happened. Uh, one is that you had an out-of-body experience and revisited the end of that particular lifetime that you had been as a, as a harem wife. So, well, that was just amazing and, and really got me thinking about, well, 
maybe then we really do have lots of different lifetimes. So I took on the, the notion of reincarnation. So that was a wonderful opening for me. And then in 1978, uh, my husband and children and I went to Europe and we went to Spain and we went to the big um, sort of palace complex, which is called the Alhambra. And we had sort of a guide take us around all the acreage of that beautiful place. And at one point we came to a room that we could kind of look down into. It had sort of a balcony around like one floor up from the floor of this room. And so I was looking down into this room and suddenly I thought, oh my God, I know this room. This is where I spent most of my time as a harem wife. Oh my goodness. I, there was a sort of a chaise lounge and a little table next to it uh, in the lower left corner of that room. And I recognized, oh, that's where I spent most of my time. And on the table, they always have grapes and raisins and fresh fruit. And I could remember all the details of that. And then I looked up at the balcony that was around the upper part of that room. And there were, a group, remembered that there was a group of men up there. They were guards and they had, they were all eunuchs. So they could not get close to us, uh, could not get intimate uh -huh. uh, with us harem wives. In other words, they were to guard that nobody would come in and, and disturb us, but they couldn't get to us themselves. But in the far corner of that room and the balcony, I was remembering seeing the man I really loved. I did not love my husband, who was the sultan, who had all these other wives too. Mm -hmm. And we all spent our days in that room uh, waiting to be called in to serve the sultan. Mm -hmm. But the man I loved was over there on that balcony over by the far wall. And I remembered very clearly that he, even just communicating with him by eyesight, by looks and mouthing words was the closest I could physically get to him um, because of the constraints of that lifetime. But anyway, that was very powerful an experience too. And I thought, wow, uh, another indication that we must really have a series of past lives. Yes, and it's very interesting. Um, this vision was 10 years after the first one. I mean, almost 10 years after Yet it was yes. the same life, and you were able to get more details and more information about that life on the actual property of where you had lived. That is amazing. Yes, and I think that um, this is what happened in the subsequent times that I'll tell about, too, um, that um, when you're in the location where you had been in a previous lifetime, that's when you are more likely to have these recalls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than just being at home and out of the blue remembering, although they can happen in, in that way too. So the next one was um, about three years later in 1981. Um, I was in Peru and in particular in Machu Picchu, Peru, and walking by myself across a big lawn that is up there as part of that complex. And I could see that there was a wall uh, to my left, and not a very high wall, and, and there was an opening, like a little doorway uh, going into that wall, and there were there were huts, or now, nowadays the remains of huts uh, from long, long ago, like a little village inside that wall, and as I was walking along this lawn toward that opening in the wall, I suddenly felt like and totally remembered being a very short, dark-skinned Peruvian girl with very straight, totally black hair, a chunky build, really different than I am now <laughs> in yeah. this lifetime. 
And that as the little girl walking across the lawn, I could remember going through that opening in the wall, that little sort of gateway and turning left and going to the second row and turning right and to the end of that pathway. And then there was my small house. And that's where I was going in this recall experience, walking toward my home. So that seemed extremely vivid. And then the next day at Machu Picchu, I was climbing that extra wonderful peak called Huayna Picchu that you see from Machu Picchu. And um, I had done plenty of mountain climbing before that and was not afraid of heights or anything. But suddenly the trail up that peak came right to the edge of the mountain. Uh, that mountain is kind of a cone shape. Okay. And when I came to one edge of it, I suddenly froze with terror out of the blue. And I couldn't move. I just was stuck there in, in terrible, terrible fear and trying to talk myself out of it. Hey, you've been at the edge of cliffs on high mountains before. There's no problem. You just you're just careful and you'll be careful. You are careful here. And other people came up and walked past me on the trail and continued on toward the top. And I, I just couldn't. I was frozen in terror and I didn't know why. So fortunately, my traveling companion who had been ahead of me noticed that I wasn't moving past that point. And he came down and took my arm and pulled me out of it. Well, I realized later in a regression that that had been a real spontaneous past life memory that had come up there. And that in that past life, I had been a young Peruvian man, again, with the dark skin and the straight dark hair and wearing kind of a loincloth and, and sandals. And that I was being chased up that peak by a man from a different tribe, another young man who had a big knife oh, in his hand. And at that point, at the edge of the peak, exactly at that point in the trail, this man was lunging at me with this big knife. And I leaned backwards and fell off the mountain, fell off the cliff. And it's a whole mile down to the rocks along the edge of the Urubamba River. So, of course, I was killed, uh, not by him, but by landing on the rocks after this huge fall. So that was really interesting that that, that would had come up. Then um, a year or so later, 1981, um, well, the same year, actually, I went to Egypt for the first time. And when I got off the plane and we were in a bus moving toward Cairo, I looked around at the landscape, very flat, very deserty. And I kept thinking, why is this so familiar to me? I've never been here before. I've never even been to anywhere that looked like this. But I just remembered it from somewhere, somehow. And I just didn't think too much more of it. But wow, this is more interesting than I had even thought. And uh, then I had a series of spontaneous past life recalls on that particular trip to Egypt. Uh, the first one after that recognition of the land, um, the next one, actually, I was in the temple of Isis at Philae. And... Um, standing in the inner chamber with my hands on a megalithic stone that looked like black onyx. I uh, just sort of went into a meditative state. And I had a very clear memory of having been long, long ago, probably two or 3,000 years ago at least, having been a young woman, priestess, living in a very luxurious home, it must have been the ruler of the land, many, many rooms and servants and so forth. He was a man of power and material wealth, my husband. And um, I was not like that at all. I was young and spiritually oriented and wanted to be a priestess 
So I would sneak out of that complex of, of rooms, that beautiful home we had with the help of a servant. And I would walk across the desert to a temple where I was being trained to be a spiritual initiate, to be a priestess. So that was a very, very uh, vivid recall that happened. I was really, really pleased to know that. And the temple of Isis at Philae is now on an island in the middle of the Nile. But that temple had been on the mainland. I did not know this before I went to that temple. I only heard it after. And um, so that fit exactly what my memory had been, that the temple was not on an island. It was on the regular land. And I could walk across that land and go to that temple where I was being trained. So that was very impactful and wonderful. And then another day on that trip, we were in a deserty area where there was a small temple, had no roof, no rooms really, but it was a series of two beautifully carved tall columns. And while we were there, uh, the memories suddenly come, come up of my being a woman with a long sort of purple and blue robe, a gown of some sort, a robe would be a better word, and that I was apparently a priestess who was conducting healing by helping people walk through the uh, columns and striking the columns with something like a wand, oh. and they would uh, give off a vibration that would actually heal the person who was walking through them. Wow. So that was a brief one, but very, very vivid. And all of these, by the way, are in total technicolor <laughs> and and CD. It seems like these uh, these things. Then there was the uh, ultimate experience of that trip, being in the Great Pyramid, mm -hmm. and being up there in the King's Chamber. I was with the whole group of people whom I was traveling with, and we were doing the Om chant with one of our group lying in the sarcophagus mm -hmm. in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. And so this process of doing the Om chant as a group, we were all standing around the sarcophagus. And as that was happening, I began to remember from long, long ago uh, doing this, being again a priestess, which by the way, I'm not in this life, <laughs> but I was a priestess and I had this sort of pink and, and purple and blue long robe outfit with big flowing sleeves. And then I moved to the head of the sarcophagus. That means where the, the end of the sarcophagus, where the head of the person lying in it was. And I was doing all these gestures, all these movements while doing the chant. And it was to help to lift the soul out of the person lying in the sarcophagus. And that would be a spiritual initiate at his last initiation and help it to leave out of the body and go up to the North Star where it would be for a while before it would come back and be considered a full, fully initiated priest. Again, this is long ago, probably two or 3,000 years ago. Uh, but the thing is that I remembered having done that in that place, and I knew exactly what the movements were and exactly what the chant was. So that was really great. And this probably so, would have been, I'm, I'm guessing this would have been the... Um... I remember reading something about what were called, I think, star cults or star, there's another word I'm looking for, star um, kind of worshiping groups back in Egypt at that time. So do you think it was? Uh, yes. Like that? Okay. Okay. It, it may have been part of that, uh, but these spiritual initiates, uh, we had been learning from the leader of our group. Uh, they would get a certain stage of initiation and each one of the temples going along the Nile from the south, from this temple of Isis at Philae, and then all the other major temples 
along the Nile, ending up with the final initiation in the Great Pyramid in the King's Chamber. So then a year and a half later, 1983, I went to Egypt again and um, had a, a remarkable experience, very powerful. Uh, we went into an underground tomb of the bull gods. So this was in the Memphis, Egypt area. And there was a time in history uh, where they considered the gods were bulls. That was only a relatively short period of time in Egyptian history, but they really worshipped the bulls. And when a bull would die, a bull god would die, it would have to have a big granite sarcophagus waiting for it. So, And the, those granite sarcophagi, uh, always with a heavy granite lid, uh, they were all carved completely, beautifully, beautifully carved with scenes of Egyptian life mm. all on them, and um, very incredibly heavy, of course, each one a few tons of weight. So we yeah. went down into this um, underground uh, chamber, tomb, and on our way down, it went sort of like an inclined ramp going down into it. And it was a beautiful day. I was feeling absolutely fine and very happy and very adventurous, everything positive. But after I had been walking along in the tomb for a few feet, I suddenly began to feel exhausted and heavy and depressed and sad that what, what is this? Mm. And I ask a couple of people walking near me, do you feel anything different here? And they said, no, but I did. And uh, within a few minutes of that, still feeling terrible, I came around a corner of one of these big sarcophagi. And then this full-blown memory with enormous feeling came up in me of having been a male slave working on the sarcophagi to get it ready. The bull guide had suddenly died and we didn't have the sarcophagus ready. And the lid, which probably weighed at least a ton, the wid lid had fallen down on a beautiful man, beautiful but dark uh, brown eyes and brown skin, who was my dearest companion in that life. We were both slaves. And I was bending over, trying to lift the lid and get other people to lift the lid so that he could live. He was squashed between the lid and the hard floor. Mm -hmm. And I could see his eyes, you know, pleading like, please help, which I was trying to do. And I was being whipped by the slave driver, but I didn't care. I just wanted to help my friend and wasn't able to. He did die under that lid. So anyway, I was, that's what that terrible feeling was, I think. Mm -hmm. And that flash of memory uh, from that, I think that that really had happened long ago. So an hour or so later, our group was on a train uh, going to Luxor. And um, I told my traveling companion, you know, please just leave our compartment and go into the club car and have a drink and have dinner and socialize. I just need to be myself and process something that's happened. So for about two hours, I processed that experience and got a sense of the whole lifetime and my whole experience with that particular friend and why he was such a precious friend because we could share about philosophy and metaphysics and spirituality. He was the only person in that life I could talk to about those things. So it was really a great loss, a great tragedy to me that he had died under that heavy fallen limb. So Lid, that, that really made a big impact on me. And it was that experience particularly that made me wonder, because I had such a catharsis of emotion, it made me 
wonder if there was some way to use this therapeutically with people, these past life memories. I was wondering, okay, okay. Yeah. So this was in 1983. I had already been practicing as a licensed therapist since 1976. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of a new addition. Uh, gee, I wonder how how this could be somehow evoked or worked with with people. I had never heard of such a thing before. Oh, wow. But it was a year later, well, about six months later, that synchronistically I went one afternoon about four o'clock into our study, turned on the television, which I had never, ever done in the daytime before or since then. But something told me to go in, turn on the television. And what was right there on the screen was a workshop going on, uh, being conducted by Helen Wombach, a clinical psychologist. And um, she was leading a group of people into past lives in regression. So I watched that program thinking, wow, that's an answer to what I've been wondering about. That is a way that I could work with people. And I noticed the way she conducted this regression. I thought, oh, gosh, I can do, I can do that easily. And then it was a year after that that I synchronistically met the woman who had founded the Association for Past Life Research and Therapies and went to their conference and then went to five years of their training doing past life regression therapy. And that prepared me for eventually, although I didn't know it at the time, it, it was preparing me for working with people who want regressions to know the details of their extraterrestrial encounters. But there were even more spontaneous recalls after that. Just very quickly, I'll mention in 1984, I went to China and at a visit to one of the emperor's summer palaces, we were just walking through the rooms and I was noticing everything. Everything, of course, was really, really beautiful. And we came around a corner and there was a very big life-size painted portrait of a woman. She had probably been the wife of the emperor. She had a beautiful, long, uh, yellow, bright yellow silk gown on. And I looked at that and thought, oh my God, that's me. That's me. I was that woman. And then, you know, that was a total shock to me. Uh, but then I began having memories of that lifetime. Also, when I was in China, on walking through the Forbidden City in Beijing, which is, oh, a mile or so long within a big wall enclosing the whole Forbidden City. And in that recall, I was a man, a Chinese servant working for the emperor and all the people in charge. And then I would climb up a tall wooden ladder uh, to look over the wall that surrounded the Forbidden City because I was living my entire life as a servant in that city, never having the opportunity to live or leave that city. I had been brought up there, born there, brought up there, and that was my life. But I was curious about the outside world so I would climb up this rickety wooden ladder, long, tall ladder, and peer over the wall and see that there were houses and roads and trees and other buildings out there, that that was the world. But it was forbidden for me to get a look at the outside world. So I had to really sneak it when I thought nobody would notice. So, so that was certainly interesting. So that was the last one that I had, um, but uh, there could be more that will be happening. But I think that that was a very fortunate thing for me because it brought my attention to the fact that we, whether we had thought so previously or not, um, that we 
do apparently have quite a series of different lifetimes and they could be in different countries, uh, different nationalities, different races, different cultures, and how wonderful uh, to get a look at that. So now I have a further understanding of the soul, which is what we really are. Mm -hmm. And we are temporarily, as we know, in this lifetime, we won't be here forever, mm -hmm. but we will be forever as a soul. And so I've learned more about the soul and how the soul chooses. Nobody's forcing us to, but we choose as a soul to come into a lifetime. And, and we choose a specific culture and race, even the specific family that we'll be born to and certain people we will be sure to meet and, and get to know in that lifetime. Uh, people that we have soul connections with mm -hmm. in various ways uh, so all of the spontaneous past life recalls sort of fit into that whole viewpoint of you know having many many lifetimes so i know that you uh, yourself have been thinking about the soul and life and life after we leave this incarnation and do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share about that? Wow. Well, I'm I'm still processing your experiences. Um, <clears throat> I've had one spontaneous past life re regression or recall myself, which is when I was about 18 or 19 years old. I was studying Buddhism and I was attending a Buddhist temple. And it, that was the first time I had ever been introduced to the idea of reincarnation. And mm -hmm. I did not fully understand it. It was still very new to me. I was kind of gathering, you know, bits and pieces and putting together what I thought it might be and learning right. it. And um, I was in this temple, a Buddhist temple here in Toronto. And um, what was interesting was, first of all, the the experience that I had happened in what was called a common room. There, there were people living communally in this building um in this temple and they shared a common room a common area where they would all eat and they would you know hang out there and have meetings there and so on and so there was always somebody there the main telephone was there there was a little kitchen out there so there was always someone there but when this happened to me there was nobody else in the room and no one came down during it either which was kind of interesting I, i'm not sure why yeah. that is but what ended up happening was I was down there and I was just wandering around, you know, just checking the place out. I think I was still fairly new to this temple. And there was a fan that was on the ceiling and it was making this kind of womp, womp, womp oh, yeah. kind of sound, right? Mm -hmm. And I had gotten a little bit sleepy and I just lay down on the carpet of this common room, you know, yeah. it wasn't my own home. I just lay down on the floor and felt sleepy <laughs> and um, the, the warm thing or the kind of whirring of the fan was a deeper kind of sound and it took me into a bit of a trance-like state because it ended up becoming drumming. And so, oh, right. yeah, so the beat of the, the rhythmic beat in a sense that the fan was creating became this beat of a drum. And then all of a sudden I was uh, a First Nations or Aboriginal or Indigenous man um, I believe in North America because I was looking over the land and this was obviously long ago before it had been developed. So there were no cities or towns or lights or lamp poles or roads. It was just miles and miles and miles of grass and trees and field as far as I could see. <clears throat> and in this vision, I was a warrior. I was very strong physically. And I remember feeling a huge amount of strength in myself and also a huge amount of grief. I was grieving. I was looking out over my land and I was grieving because I knew that I was witnessing the end of my people and the end of the time that oh. we've always known and the end of the land. I think I must have been there when the Europeans were coming and colonizing or something was going on. <laughs> Yeah, and that was really interesting because I had had uh, a very strong pull um, towards First Nations people and Indigenous culture for a really long time. And I had had emotional reactions to mm -hmm. uh, the connection, the, the connective moments that I had had. So, for example, when I was in grade eight 
and I was about 12 or 12 years old. I had just moved to a totally new neighborhood on the other side of the city. Didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. I was the new kid, still didn't have friends in school, you know, and we were going on a class trip. So I went on this class trip with all these kids I didn't know yet, feeling very mm -hmm. much like the new kid and kind of, you know, not not feeling like I was in a familiar place. And we ended up going to um, a place. I don't know exactly what it was. I can't remember. Um, but we went to a school or a building of some kind where they had it was Indigenous people. That was the whole theme of this trip was to go and witness Indigenous culture and learn about it. And so there was a drumming circle and um, there were three young Indigenous men who were in the middle of the circle. We were the circle, the school kids and the teachers were the circle. And in the middle were these three young men and they started drumming. And I started crying out of absolutely nowhere. I was 12 and I just felt this massive amount of emotion and I started, I burst into tears and I was sobbing because of the sound of the drumming and the way it made me feel. So there were a few incidents like that where I, I had not fully understood what was happening to me. I couldn't really fully understand why I was having that emotional response or why I was having such a strong reaction. But then when I had that recall, um, I thought, oh, this must be why. And so that's yeah. the only one I've ever had. But um, I didn't know, <clears throat> it sounds like you, you know, even though you had your very first one very unexpectedly on the massage table, like you said, in 1969, you did not see that coming. It just happened. Um, no. And a little while after that, when you had had your third or fourth one, you talked about how you needed time to process what had occurred. You needed a couple yeah. of hours. So what did that processing look like for you? Because for me, I had this experience. It absolutely uh, stunned me, you know, did not expect that. And I knew it was real. I just knew, you know, there's no, yeah. I just knew. Right. And so, yeah. you know, what I'm saying, right, that feeling of just knowing, you know, it's not a vision, you know, it's not a daydream or a dream. It feels mm -hmm. completely different. And your whole it's like every cell in your body is saying, yes, I know this experience or I recognize this. Yes. So yes. You must have had also that feeling. And then how did you Definitely. process it? Like, how did you, what was processing like for you after you had these experiences? Well, having been very engaged always um, in with a lot of things going on in my life, um, I, I think I didn't give a lot of attention to it until the Egypt experiences, particularly that last one with the tragedy happening. I mean, then, and with all the two hours of sobbing and grief that came up, you know, then, I mean, I really had to pay attention. So in other words, with the earlier experiences, okay, they happened. And I was thinking that, that you know maybe maybe we do really have more than just this one life and so it was just sort of a pondering becoming more and more open to the idea but not really uh talking with people about it um no not really getting feedback and and i'm remembering now in talking to you that actually uh, my first spontaneous past life recall was when I was four years old. So what happened is that uh, I was in the car with my parents. We had had a day trip uh, to Montauk Point on Long, the far eastern tip of Long Island. We lived um, on Long Island, but closer to New York City. And but so we'd had this day trip out to the end of the island, and on the way back, um, I was sitting in the kneeling on the back seat, looking out the back window. Uh, when I was four years old, we did not have seat belts yet, yes. <laughs> so we kids were free to do whatever we wanted in the back seat. So I was kneeling there, looking out the back window with my arms up on the is sort of a shelf. Well, we don't have our cars like that now, but they used to have a shelf on the back of the back seat or the top of the back seat and then the window, the back window. So I was looking out the back window and as we were driving along, my parents in the front seats 
And I, I was looking at the road and how it sort of went up and down a series of rises and falls, very gently, very nice. And looking at it, I suddenly thought and said, oh, I remember this road, except that it was lighter in color. It was more of a white, uh, whiter, off-white color. And in my day, uh, it was actually like dark gray. <laughs> and um, so I said to my partner, oh, I remember this road, except it was lighter color and we weren't in a car. And so it must have been, you know, back before we had cars to travel around and probably a horse and wagon or horse and carriage. I don't, don't didn't get that detail, but I knew that I had been on that road with the, uh, the swing ups and downs. And my parents didn't know what to think about that because they weren't thinking about reincarnation. <laughs> so they just sort of fluffed it off. Oh, that's cute, dear, or something like that, <laughs> but not thinking anything of it. And of course, I had no context for it and nobody to talk to about it. So it just was one of those things that just happened. And oh, okay. Yeah. yeah think I about that later. <laughs> I can relate to that very much because I think a lot of people, when they have unusual experiences when they're little, don't really talk about them because when you're when you're little when you're that young you you first of all don't even know how necessarily to talk about it you don't know what words to use yeah. and you don't know who to go to because you I think even when you're that <laughs> young this is my experience anyway I just knew that something about it was different than the world I was living in and that it wouldn't really translate that's basically how I, was, <laughs> right. I had this I just had this feeling that you know like I didn't even think about telling someone about it. It didn't even occur to me because it was just a no go. Like it just seemed automatically, you know, it, it didn't make sense to me to try to do that. But right. in terms of processing though, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about your process in making sense of all this, because you mentioned a little while ago with one of your experiences that at the time that you had been, I think you were the harem wife, you had been on an island, the the um the temple. Oh no, you were a priestess, and the the temple that you were in had been on right. the island back then. Yes, you know. Yes. So so part of your this is partially what fascinates me anyway about past lives, the past life therapy, and past life regressions, and spontaneous past life recalls is that if people have a lot of detail in these experiences, which we often do then you can actually go to books and historical texts and look up the details and find validation of what you had seen. So it sounds like yes. you did that because you found out that the land had actually changed from the time you yes. had been there as a priestess to now. Is, yeah, is that the, part of what Yeah, the doing? whole temple had changed its location from the mainland on one side of the Nile to the island had been deconstructed and then reconstructed more in um, our lifetime earlier in so probably in the 20th century or 19th century uh, that happened wow and it's more re more much more recently located on that island but i didn't hear that information about that temple and that island until after we had been there Yes, and so that and, was and like then that and then when it was told to us that oh by the way that temple we visited this morning that used to be over there on that particular side of the Nile but they deconstructed it and reconstructed it on the island and then I thought oh well no wonder that's why I remembered um, being on the land I didn't go from an island. Uh -huh to the temple I walked from the big complex of homes um, to that temple, which was on the mainland. Wow. I mean, have you had that happen before? Yes. With, I was... with other recalls that you've had, have you looked up historical information that validated what you had seen in your vision or, you know, made you feel even more like, yes, this really happened. Did you even need to do that? No. I don't think I have because, um, for one thing, they just seemed so totally real. Mm. 
that I didn't feel the need to. Okay. But there was an experience in China, in addition to the one I mentioned, um, it, it was not a spontaneous past life recall, but a very, very interesting experience to me. We went to the uh, town or city of Xi'an, where there are these uh, Xi'an terracotta soldiers and horses oh, yes. that an emperor had had built uh, for uh, this was many, many, many centuries ago, probably a thousand years ago at least. And that particular emperor um, wanted to have an army with the horses and the weapons and everything um, to accompany him after he would die. So he had these life-size terracotta sculptures made of hundreds I think there are a couple of thousand, actually, uh, soldiers and horses that the soldiers used. And then he died, and the terracotta soldiers remained pretty much intact all these years, a couple thousand years. And they are located, they're all lined up in kind of a, almost like a big pit, well, a building. Um, and then there was a walkway, wooden walkways nowadays where you can walk kind of above the statues all standing there in formation uh -huh. and kind of look down at them uh -huh. a few feet above. So we were walking on the platform. This was in 1984, uh, walking on the platform. And I was looking down at these soldiers and admiring them and and um, how very lifelike they looked each one had a, a different face and a different expression i mean it was just like seeing real people except that they were made of terracotta clay and the same with the horses they all seemed very individual but the main thing is that as i was walking on that platform and admiring them i had this tremendous feeling of sadness and grief and I asked other people walking with me, do you feel anything special? And they said, no, these are just really beautiful. These are special. That's all. And But I felt like having a real cry. Um, I didn't, but I felt like it. And um, I, I felt a tremendous amount of sadness and grief. And yet the statues looked very pleasant. They were very pleasant expressions, mm -hmm. like nothing was wrong with them okay so after visiting that place uh we had lunch and got back into the bus that we were touring around in and the tour guide said after we had left the city and we're going through the countryside she said you see that mound over there it was kind of like a big rounded hill and uh, we we all saw that she said that is where all of the real soldiers that you saw the statues being replicas of, they had been killed after the um, after the emperor died, he ordered that all of those soldiers and horses be killed. And that's where they were buried in now in that there are skeletons, I'm sure um, now. So I suddenly built, oh, my God. That's why I was feeling such grief there. I didn't know that happened to them. That's so I was thinking of replicas of these people, but the real people, you know, had just been mercilessly killed after the emperor died. So I thought that was really interesting that those two things went together. And I was so glad that I had not known that about the terracotta soldiers when I was visiting them. I'm glad that I didn't know that till afterwards. So in other words, I just had my own genuine feeling picked up by intuition or energy or whatever. Mm -hmm. Something really tragic about them. So well, I think that these is really things... Tragic. That is yeah. really tragic. I mean, it, it is really interesting how 
as you're saying, we kind of map our experiences by being open to all these subtle things that can come together, not just having a big, you know, blasting past life recall, <laughs> obvious experience where it's a past life recall. Yeah. Also these sort of subtle emotional experiences and senses and synchronicities that help to give us clues or other pieces of the of the of the picture so that we can more fully understand what we're experiencing. It is very interesting how that happens. And of course yes. you have to practice it. Right? It is being receptive. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's very helpful too that they don't all happen at once. In other words, with my experiences from age four <laughs> on up through a number of my adult years, um, that was a nice slow pace mm -hmm. to get ooh, sort of introduced in a very powerful way to these different concepts, these different aspects of reality as yeah. I, I see it now, that we're not taught that. And and that is true of so many things that that exist and really influence us a lot. And yet we're not introduced to that in any of the teachings that, that we get here on earth. So it's very wonderful. And that's why I'm sharing this today, uh, that if anybody is listening to this who's had that sort of thing happen and they really wonder about that in some cases it's kind of troubling in other kind of cases it's kind of exciting and they're curious and whoa what does that mean mm -hmm. uh, anyway nowadays we have a wonderful chance to grow and to experience different aspects of reality uh, that we had not known about before and wonderful that we can share these because it really can help to hear, hear these things if you've had these kinds of experiences. And even if you haven't had these kinds of experiences, that's fine too. And it just means that hearing about them from other people, like from you, what you've shared and me, um, it, it expands our understanding of things. It, rounds out the picture to some extent of, of reality and so that we're not so lost in the minutia of, of living our lives here. Yes. Uh, it helps our general consciousness to be aware of a fuller picture yeah. like this. Yeah, so you know I agree. I mean, you know I agree. I feel like it's it's absolutely crucial for this time that we're all spending together as a collective race here on Earth. Uh, there's such a huge amount of shifting and changing, changing, transitioning uh, going on that it really is cracking people open in a new way, it seems. And people are asking different questions about life and you know, thinking yeah. more about what is life? What are we doing here? What is really going on? You know, what is the meaning of of why we're here? And especially now yeah. that we have it confirmed by worldwide governments, I'm still sort of blown away by the fact that this information is out there about UFOs being real and extraterrestrials being real. I mean, it has been officially stated by worldwide governments, most recently the US, but we just keep on trucking. You know, we're still just going to work and going, getting our groceries <laughs> and paying our bills. I mean, it's just <laughs> incredible how, um, you know, this knowledge is seeping into our mainstream consciousness in a way that we're not quite reacting to or responding to yet collectively, right? But we have all these opportunities to be cracked open a little more and ask different questions and think about things a little differently and try to expand, as you're saying, our consciousness and our experience of being human. So I love that we're doing this together. This was Barbara's yes. whole episode two. And uh, <laughs> I think, you know, we could talk for probably another hour on this, on just this one topic. I have questions for you, but I want to ask you one before we sign off. We've almost done our, our hour and we promised to, that we would keep it to about an hour for our audience. Um, do you feel like you got a sense of the lessons that you were supposed to learn in these different lifetimes that you had? Do you feel like with these recalls, you got a sense of why you had lived those lives and what you were supposed to get out of them? Well, in the ones that seem to be um, more spiritually oriented, like the ones in um, Egypt in, in particular, um, 
it, it certainly has helped me to realize why I have a lot of interest about those sorts of things mm -hmm. in this lifetime. Also, um, it's helped me to realize why I felt very, very drawn to visit those particular countries. And as you know, um, it's quite an effort and quite an expense <laughs> to do the traveling to these faraway countries. Um, so I did many, many, many trips to various other countries. And these past life recalls have helped me to realize why it is it has been important for me to be there. For instance, ever since I was a child, I was very, very interested in China. I was very interested in India and very interested in Egypt, those, those three in particular. And so that meant as an adult, um, I actually got myself motivated and together to, to go to those countries. And that's where I had those experiences mm -hmm. and something about Peru, of course, too. And um, so I, I have sort of made it a practice in my life uh, to pay attention to where I'd like to visit. I just have the feeling that there's something there that I may have experienced in the past. I mean, some particular compelling reason why I've been interested in those countries and not in certain other ones. In fact, there are a couple of countries that I have not visited purposely, and I've had plenty of opportunity to visit them. Oh. In other words, other groups going there or other individuals I know who've invited me to go on trips to them. One of those is Japan, and one of those is um, Israel. Uh -huh. So I am guessing that I, I don't know this, but I'm guessing that it could be that I've had past lives in those two parts of the world, and those experiences were bad enough, personally, mm -hmm. for me, that I just don't want to go there again. Uh, I don't feel do that. Do you think a, that. I guess it, it, it's sort of a, a said, no, don't, don't go to Japan, even though I think it would be, I mean, in my rational mind, it says, oh, I'd especially love to go to Kyoto. And uh, there are certain places it would be very lovely to go to. And the same with Israel. Um, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see the Dead Sea. I'd love to see, you know, where... Jesus went out into the desert and so forth. And um, but there's always something overriding that in my awareness is no, no, don't go there, don't go there. Oh, interesting. It's not that it's dangerous to go there now. It's not that sort of feeling. It's more of a sort of a foreboding from somewhere else, from the past, I think, somehow. Interesting. Interesting. It's like an aversion to going. I'm not sure that I have that. I'm going to ask myself that question. Do, and I ha do I have an aversion to going to any countries? Because like you, I love to travel and I think it's very important to travel and to see the world and to give ourselves experiences like that. But yeah. um, hmm, interesting. I guess we can ask ourselves, the audience and I, you know, do, yeah. where do we feel attracted to go and where do we feel an aversion to going? Um, but yeah. I really like what you said about paying attention, you know, paying attention to that part of us that feels a pull to go somewhere or pull to experience something or to try something. You know, I think there's always a reason for that kind of in instinct, even if up here it, does, it makes no sense to us at all. Our body is saying, yeah. go and do this. And, you know, yeah. So right. that. yeah. So we're going to keep following our instincts and our and our um our highest excitement. There's something that Bashar says. I like Bashar a lot, and there's something that he says yeah. that I love, um, which that you probably know this one, Barbara. He says, "Follow your highest excitement, excitement, or be in be in the state of your highest excitement without any attachment to the outcome. Just follow mm. that, that feeling of excitement, that pull, that feeling yeah. of 
you know, oh, pay attention to this. And that gives us these amazing experiences in life that teach us more and more about who we really are as we go along, right? And I think that you're absolutely right. And I think that you and I are doing this right now. I think we are. Too. All of our excitement to share about these particular aspects of reality that we've experienced. Yes. Yes, and there's going to be more coming. Yeah. This is only episode two of Barbara School, and I think we should probably sign off, but we'll be coming yeah. back for more and um, just really hope that the audience is enjoying this. We wanted to make sure to put this information out, what Barbara knows and um, what she's experienced and be able to have conversations about it together that we really hope the audience is going to enjoy and that we're going to inspire you to have new experiences that will crack you open a little more to what's really going on in life and in the universe, in the cosmos. So Barbara, thank you so much oh. for being here and we'll see everyone again very soon. It was great to be with you Wonderful. as always. Thank you. Wonderful.